So I see a few familiar faces in the audience. So it looks like you're here for a remedial tutorial. That's great. Um, uh, while we are waiting, uh, let me introduce a couple of people who are also affiliated with FIDO here. Um, uh, Brett McDowell, who's uh, Brett. Um, so Brett um, is, uh, was at PayPal and uh, most recently, and is currently the executive director of the uh, um, uh, FIDO Alliance. And he can tell you a lot um, from a couple of different perspectives, both from the standards perspective and also from a deployment perspective. Uh, he can speak very uniquely to, to the perspective there about why FIDO was important to PayPal and, and how he expects to move uh, through the standards process uh, at the Alliance. And then we have Donald O'Shea. Um, over here, Donald um, is the membership coordinator for uh, the Alliance, and so if there's interest in, in participating, um, uh, by all means, uh, chat Donald up. And then uh, there's a couple of people. I, I don't know if uh, we have anybody from, from Ubico here or plug up. No? OK. Uh, some folks in the back over there, um, some, some members of the Alliance that have solutions that you can buy and deploy today. Um, knock Knock's one of them, Ubico's another. There's a, there's a half a dozen others. OK, so let me start with, um, with uh, context and aspiration. So Knock Knock Labs. Um, my background, I've been in the security space for about 15 years, DRM, PKI, infrastructure, uh, PGP was the last company that, that I was at for about six years. And, um, and we are one of the founders uh, of the Alliance, uh, along with PayPal and, and a number of other, other folks. Um, and there are some very good reasons why we put this together the way we did. And so I'd like to take you through an overview uh, to help you understand this before you dive into the bits and bytes. So, so I like to say that, that we've been able to scale about everything in the computing space. You can rent petabytes of storage in the sky. You can harness dozens of CPUs. Authentication is this one damn constant that hasn't changed. It's largely based on username passwords today. We've kind of chipped away at the problem with a few uh, multi-factor things here and there. There's lots of little widgets, um, but in, in general, auth hasn't scaled. And so the problem is a little bit like saying, I want to build skyscrapers and I want to transform the, the, the landscape and the city line of, of Manhattan, but I'm going to build these skyscrapers with wood because that's all I know how to build. And that's a terrible way to go build skyscrapers. And it wasn't until the invention of the steel I-beam um, that you were able to, to build very interesting, very large, very scalable structures. And, uh, and I think in our, in our space, which is authentication, um, there's certainly that need. Now, you know, this is not out of a lack of trying. Uh, as you all know, I'm, I'm sure all of you as enterprises have struggled at one point or another with one or another form of authentication that is better than passwords. Um, you know, we had biometrics, OTP tokens, the, the uh, you know, I'll, I'll send you something over one channel and you'll type it into into another thing and send it up on another channel. So two, two, sc two screens, single channel, one screen, two channels, you know, all, all these kinds of solutions. Silicon-based stuff, TPMs have been out there for a while. Uh, secure elements had a certain amount of promise. Here's the problem. The problem is that from, a, from the perspective of an implementer, from the perspective of someone who is consuming the value of all of these things, uh, you, had a very, you had a very poor bargain to contend with, which was you know, things were based on silos um, uh, and, and, and proprietary technologies, in some cases making egregious compromises on the, on the privacy of individuals. There was sometimes a reliance on third parties where they didn't need to be. Sometimes there were toll-based infrastructures that were set up. Um, and, and really, that's, that's not a great way to go build scalable systems. Um, the analogy, again, is if you're trying to create uh, a building structure and if every light fixture, uh, if every receptacle came with a unique piece of wiring all the way back to the home panel, you'd never get that damn house built, right? And so, so there's a reason why standardization uh, is, is useful in certain instances. And so, so as I said, um, if, if you're an implementer, you know this problem. I have an app. Um, I have a device. I have a certain risk profile that mandates the use of one kind of authenticator, um, and I've got one kind of plumbing, and then I've got n kinds of plumbings by the end of the day, and what I have is a rat's nest at the end of the day. So, so we solved this problem as an industry before. Uh, we, we solved it for networking by standardizing on Ethernet. 
We solved it very messily for email. Eventually, we kind of ended up on a, on a few things that by and large work. And most recently, we solved it uh, in the case of, of, uh, of SSL, uh, the problem of how to build a secure tunnel from a web browser to a web server. And um, SSL did something very interesting. Right? It, it, it was a proprietary technology invented by Netscape that they decided to put out into the, the public domain and, and, uh, and share with a, with a number of other industry partners initially before it went and became a standard at, at, uh, at the ITF. And SSL did three very interesting things that are worth pondering. The first is it made life simple for the end user. Right? The security value proposition about that tunnel was reduced to look for the lock, look for the HTTPS, you're done. If you're a programmer, you don't need to be an expert in Diffie-Hellman or core cryptography um, of, of any sort. You take a few APIs, uh, you take an implementation either from a systems provider or rent a, a third-party implementation or create one if you like, take, take, uh, take one and, and you've got a secure tunnel. And for the operator, you could take the same protocol, same infrastructure, regardless of the, the manufacturer and the device that was interacting with you, and you could scale the security up or down. You could say, I'm very paranoid, and I will use hardware security modules on the server side, smart cards on the client side. I'm so paranoid, I'm going to toss all those damn routes out, and I'm only going to trust this one route. Fantastic. You can do all of that. Or you can say, I don't need all of that. For me, self-signed certs are good enough. And the system still works, right? And so the question is, where's the equivalent on the, on the authentication side, both for devices and for users? There's another interesting thing that made SSL very successful, because if you know, SSL wasn't about payments, it wasn't about national defense, and it wasn't about pornography, right? But, but it gets used very successfully in all of those instances. And so I think it's very important when you're designing something that's standards-based to try and keep the semantics as lean as possible and non-domain specific. Okay, so, so I think we know what we need. We need an open standard. We need a plugin-based approach, any method of authentication, any device. Uh, we need an interoperable ecosystem. And if we achieve all of those, then maybe we can let users talk to services or devices talk to services using this open plug-and-play kind of, kind of standard. And then maybe we've got a chance to evolve towards usable authentication, which is the other big barrier that we've had um, for authentication. Right? Um, all these different methods, OTPs are wonderful for technical professionals, you know, little tokens you transcribe. Um, I, I bet you you get past the age of 40 and you're, you're struggling with that thing, you know, looking for your, your eyeglasses or something. It's not a mass market technology. So, um, so we believe that there are, there are many, there's no one size fits all here. Right? Um, and, and this is the other problem that has often occurred where somebody said, hey, I've invented the coolest widget. If you adopt my widget, it will solve word hunger or, or you know, the world's authentication problems. And the fact is that there is no one size fits all. There are, there are too many device classes. There are too many different methods of authentication. There are too many risk profiles. And everybody's business is different. And so what you really want is the ability to pick and choose something that is risk appropriate and business appropriate. And that's what a good standard should accomplish. OK, so um, FIDO 101, um, we, we have this nonprofit. It's called the FIDO Alliance. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it later on as we, as we go forward. But our mission is to change authentication, and, and our goal is to develop these unencumbered specifications. We are big believers in rough consensus, working code, and adoption to drive a standard. That's one way to drive a standard. There's another way to drive a standard, which is, oh, go write something and pray. You know? And, and, and we, are, we are firm believers that, that we need to, to get these out there with working code and, and adoption. Um, the goal of the FIDO Alliance is also to operate programs that help drive some of this adoption. And then uh, it's baked into the charter of the organization that as these standards mature, they will be taken either in whole or in part um, to organizations such as the W3C or the IETF or, or IEEE. There are different aspects of the standard that might end up in, in different places. Okay, so, so um, let me start maybe with a little bit of disambiguation because, um, you know, when, when Paul said, well, you know, why do you need to do federation? Why do you need to do authentication? How do these two things link together? Um, this is my, my sort of 101 um, for, for those of you um, that require the disambiguation. 
So it, it's a little identity pyramid. Um, and and the, the base problem is the problem of translating a physical identity into a digital identity. Somebody shows up at your doorstep and says, hey, I, I, I want an account. I need to be provisioned. Uh, can you make me your customer? And that is not a problem that FIDO is trying to solve. Okay? Lots of clever ideas in that space. Um, people are looking at social reputation uh, systems. They're looking at all kinds of cool things there. Historically, credit bureaus have supplied some information to this area. If you're an enterprise, you have your own know your customer process. This is not a problem FIDO is trying to solve. There is another problem, which is the user management and life cycle at scale. When you're talking about uh, a million, 300 million, 500 million users, the kind of life cycle problems that accrue are, are pretty interesting. And, and, uh, and you know, a lot of people have been inventing cool stuff to, to make sure that we can do this stuff at scale. Um, you know, people get married, people change names, people lose devices, they need to be reprovisioned in the system. Uh, they change roles. Uh, you know, I, I was an old PKI guy, and, and you know, we used to have endless arguments about what should be in a certificate and what should be outside the certificate. Um, not a problem that FIDO is trying to solve. Okay? Authentication is the problem that FIDO is trying to solve, and I'll come back to it. Then there is the federation issue, which is I log into United. United tells Hertz, hey, Rajiv's a good guy. Don't make him create another username and password. Let him book a car, and if there's a problem, United and Hertz will sort it out, okay? And there's some plumbing related to that that happens through the federation layer, um, and that is not a problem that FIDO is trying to solve. Okay, and then finally, after all of that, there's the end user experience of using a single credential to navigate multiple services or multiple online experiences. Sometimes that, that uh, impact is achieved through federation, sometimes through authentication. It doesn't matter, the point is, FIDO is not trying to solve the single sign-on problem directly either, okay? So what is FIDO? FIDO is a building block, and it's a building block that's informed by one particular insight. So when we started this effort, we had the, the luxury of walking around the back ends of some of the larger players in Silicon Valley and beyond, um, the PayPals, the Amazons, the, the Googles, and so forth. And what you notice is that, that by and large, while they still use passwords at the front end, they would kind of thrown in the towel on front-end authentication, and all of them have built out very significant risk-based capabilities in the back end. And so if you look at where modern authentication is headed, it's really the combination of, of some kind of authentication, whether it's you know, password-based or some kind of strong authentication, um, or multi-factor authentication, and, and some kind of a risk calculation in the back end. So front-end claim to who you are, a back-end risk calculation uh, related to that. Okay, so with that framework, what FIDO is trying to solve is the authentication problem as a building block that fits into this pyramid um, that is focused on trying to create a standard in this area to allow you to have a, a plug and play standard for user and device authentication. Okay, so what is user authentication? Just to remind people it's not just about logging in. It's also about every time I approve something online, do you want to transfer your records from dentist A to dentist B? Um, do you want to delete these thousand files? Well, you know, there are often places where today we do not authenticate people because it's a pain in the butt. And, and, and there are some instances where we are required by regulation to seek user consent. And, and all of these represent points of friction, but they're all about authentication. And today the way we do it is we ask the user for passwords. I think if you're in the e-commerce industry, um, you probably know that the highest point of friction is when the user's loaded up that shopping cart and says, uh, forget it. Okay? So, uh, so what are the problems with today's passwords? I think a lot of people have spoken about the pain of passwords. Um, I, 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 I summarize it in this uh, study that Jan Rain did that said 47% of the users that were surveyed would rather clean a toilet then pick a new password. That tells you what the end user's attitudes are towards passwords, and you know what they do. You can impose any regime on them um, that you like. At the end of the day, they're going to simplify their life because they are cognitively overloaded, and that, that cognitive overload drives them to use a single password across multiple sites, and you are toast. Because when, when, the, when you know, I, I has cats website, which for God, God knows why, they required a password, um, the same password that you used in your corporation, now suddenly I has cats, loses uh, the password cache, and all of a sudden your corporation is vulnerable. So I think people understand this problem 
Um, what you don't understand about it is perhaps the, 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 the nature of, of the, the problem from a scalability of attack perspective. Right? So, so the, the fact is that passwords are about symmetric shared secrets that are cached on the, on the that, that are present on the client, that are present on the server. And that, that server cache of, of symmetric secrets is, a, is an awfully compelling target for someone to go after. And then in talking to CIOs, uh, you know, I think everybody understands today that, that um, if someone decides to pick on you, um, the odds are that they're going to get into your network in an interesting way. And, and the only question is, do you know whether you've been compromised or don't you know you've been compromised? And, and the secrets are all laid bare, unfortunately. So what that does, though, is it creates a scalable attack. If you look at the loss of passwords and the consequences that accrue, whether you read Krebs on security or Schneier or any of these guys, what you realize very quickly is that they, they get stolen over here, and two weeks later, somebody's running them to do account compromises over there for different purposes, for driving spam, for creating fraudulent accounts, for doing all kinds of interesting things. But the problem that we are living with today with passwords is the problem of scalable attacks. So, so when we think about security, that's an interesting problem to think about, which is, you know, are you going to be able to rescue every single attempt to try and hack an end user's credentials? Maybe, maybe not. That's not the goal. The goal is first and foremost to prevent scalable attacks in this system. Obviously, there's the phishing problem, and then a more pernicious issue um, is, is, this, is this problem of malware. Um, that does some kind of key logging effectively basically saying, well, even if you have a nice complex password, I'm just going to try and, and, and harvest it and then send it upstream. And there are some very interesting pieces of malware that, um, that have started to, to hit um, uh, some of the, the early multi-factor mechanisms that are in use, such as SMS um, and, uh, and OTPs. So, so those are you know, fishable to some extent, and you, know, you, can, you can basically fool the user. So if we devise a system, uh, it better be a, a damn good improvement over the state of affairs that we have right now. So what we observed is that there is this mega trend, and the mega trend is all of us are carrying around these increasingly personal devices with us. Um, and these personal devices have a, a lot of interesting information on them, and we've gotten used to this idea that, well, we better go around and secure that in some interesting way. And we started out with, you know, PIN codes, like, uh, you know, four-digit PIN codes. And if your enterprise forces you, maybe it's a six-digit PIN code. Um, and, and then the, the manufacturers themselves realized that this was a bit of a pain. And they've all been working very hard to incorporate novel methods of authentication on the client to help you unlock that particular device. Uh, some of the early attempts, and Motorola, I think, was one of the earliest to put a fingerprint sensor, for example. Others have tried voice and, and face and so forth. Some methods have worked, some methods haven't. The point is that everybody cottoned on to this idea that we need simpler, stronger, local authentication to unlock these devices. And so, so if you think about the problem, which is we need simpler, stronger authentication online, we have, we are driving towards simpler, stronger local device authentication. Why don't we put these two things together? Why not have the user authenticate to the device and let the device authenticate to the network? Okay, so this is the core idea behind FIDO. If you take away one thing today, let that be it, which is the basic model here is that the user authenticates the device using one of any convenient method of authentication that is acceptable to the relying party there, okay? Could be biometrics, could be silicon, could be silicon built into the device, could be silicon outside the device, could be software, it doesn't matter. User authenticates to device, and then the device authenticates the network, and the way that the device authenticates the network is a challenge response-based public-private key pair protocol, and I'll go more into that for a second, but you realize that some of the benefits that accrue when you design the system like that is you've created layers of abstraction in the system that insulate this back end from becoming the rat's nest that I just showed you earlier, right? Okay, so we'll go through some of that. Um, there are two um, core standards that are making their way through the FIDO Alliance. One is called FIDO UAF, the other is called FIDO U2F, um, and, and the easiest way to distinguish between them is that you can think about UAF as, as wanting to make the, the big leap, which is we want to drive straight towards a passwordless world, okay? And, uh, and the example that is, that's shown here for UAF is a biometric-based example, but it very well could be, could be other forms of authentication. So I, I am on my little iPad or something, and, and, uh, and I have some transaction that I'm asked to approve, 
um, I swipe my finger or show my or, or tap a finger or, or something like that, show a biometric of some kind, and I'm done with my transaction. Essentially, that's the experience that UAF is trying to drive. Um, U2F is, is trying to drive towards a slightly different user experience, which is, look, we want to transition users slowly into that world, and we want to seek from them a username. We want to seek a password from them, and then we want them to offer a physically separate second factor. Could be a USB key with a secure element on it, for example. Um, they plug it in. Um, there's some, some mechanisms to indicate user presence, but not much more and then you're done with the, with, the, with the equation. And there are many interesting benefits that accrue on both of these sides, but the essential difference is passwordless versus, versus password-based. And the mechanics under both of these protocols are almost identical. Um, so what are the mechanics? Let's, let's go through them. Um, so so I'm, I, I don't look like a Bob, but let's pretend for a second that I'm Bob. Um, and, and so Bob goes to, to site.com and says, look, I want to register as a new user, and, and that site is going to go through with Bob its know your customer process. Um, or Bob might be provisioned already as a user, in which case Bob is logged in and, and is within some zone where um, the site says, well, I'd like to enroll you um, using uh, one of these methods of authentication. Let's pretend for a second that the, the, the authentication modality here is a fingerprint sensor, and, and there is a process in the protocol where both sides can, can sort of talk to each other about, about what's appropriate. Uh, so there is some user consent involved. The user says, yes, I want to enroll my fingerprint. And what that does is it creates a, 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 a match of a template that biometric here in the FIDO system is always stored locally. Important, important factor to realize. Right. There are many kinds of biometric um, operations. You, know, you can do matching of templates on the server. You can do matching of templates on the, on the client. Um, FIDO is very clear in, in what we recommend and, and what we stand for and where our certifications uh, go, which is that biometric template should never leave the local device. OK, so I enroll my fingerprint. There's a template here locally. There's a public-private key pair that's being generated as a result of that. The public key is then exported to the site and it's linked to my user account, okay? That's the essential mechanics behind both UAF and U2F. Okay, and so now when I, Bob, go back to this site, um, the site can throw me a challenge and say, please authenticate, which, which uh, requires me to swipe my finger. Um, that fingerprint template is then matched with the template that is stored locally. It unlocks the private key that is associated with this site a little caveat there, which is these keys are unique to the pairing of the user, the authenticator, and the website, okay? Which means that you get some interesting properties related to non-linkability. So this public key that's sitting here is unique to, to this user and this, uh, this particular um, device. Um, and, and then the challenge uh, is, is signed and returned, and my login is, is then therefore completed. I can go on with, with life. FIDO doesn't do session management. So those of you that, that you know, run are used to, to figuring, oh, well, we, you know, where does session management play a role in this? It hooks into those systems. FIDO doesn't hold a primary user record. You have your IAM system to do that, right? So we'll come back. So that's the essential experience behind both UAF and U2F. In the U2F system, you would have plugged in some kind of a USB device and, and maybe tapped it or something like that. OK. So what we've done is we've decoupled the user verification method which is on the client, and said, gee, you can use any of these methods of authentication. You decide what's business appropriate and risk appropriate for you. You can use stuff that is built in by the OEM. You know, Samsung's bundled in a, a fingerprint sensor. Uh, you know, Apple's bundled in uh, a, a sensor. Some people are, have secure elements on their devices. Some people are opening up the TE to certain, certain entities. You decide what's, what's appropriate for you. And then the online protocol is the other element of standardization um, that abstracts away how these two sites talk to each other. OK, so a quick architectural overview. Um, and in, in this architectural overview, um, people often ask, how do you manifest this particular protocol? So, so let's pretend there's a user agent or a mobile app of some kind, it's a browser or a, or a mobile app. Um, in, in the UAF system, there is a client. This client can be bundled into the mobile app. Um, it can be pushed out by some kind of, of management system, or it's bundled with the OEM. Um, 
It has an essential abstraction called the ASM, which is the authenticator uh, specific module. And that allows you to talk to all of these different classes of authenticators out there. And underneath this ASM, this authenticator concept is this authenticator stores uh, the authentication keys. And remember, it's not a single key, it's multiple keys. It's one that's unique to every site that you're going to. If I go to Amazon and I go to eBay, these are two different, different keys. And then there is this thing called attestation and I skipped that for a second in the interest of simplicity. But one of the problems that accrues in this, in this design, when you say, well, user authenticates to device, device authenticates to, to the network, um, is how do you know that that fingerprint sensor or that USB device is really a genuine device and, and not some emulation in, in software? Because in, from a security perspective, that's really important. Or if I'm dealing with a fingerprint sensor that happens to do its matching in software versus some kind of protected space in firmware, okay? From a relying party perspective, these are really important pieces of information because remember the context. In modern authentication, it's a two-step process. I have a risk engine in the back. I want to make some reasoned calculations about whether I, I accept something, whether I need additional authentication or not. And, and so um, the attestation process is basically the authenticator proving to the back end that it's really a, a, a genuine authenticator. And it's from manufacturer X, and it has implementation characteristics Y. Okay. What the server has is basically a, a, a server that sits next to an IAM infrastructure and, and stores a cache of public keys. Okay, U2F, again, very simply, in the U2F system, one of the, one of the interesting aspects of the U2F system is that because we've moved our, our security boundaries in some sense out to the uh, external token, this is that USB device or you know, could, be, could be some other class of device, but let's talk about USB for a second. Um, what I can do is I can push something through the browser through JavaScript and you know, obviously there's a, there's a tiny piece of software that's needed in there. But essentially the server side looks very similar, which is you know, I've, I've got a cache of public keys here. Um, Rolf and, and um, Dirk are going to go into this in excruciating detail, um, and, uh, and so we'll, we'll skip the rest of the, the detail here, and I'll, I'll try and take you through. So to sum up, um, there are two standards that are making their way through the FIDO Alliance, uh, UAF and U2F. One is a passwordless experience. The other is a classic second factor experience. And, uh, and you've got some choices. And then uh, we do believe and we hope that in, in the very near future, you know, probably uh, uh, in the next phase of the development that we're working on, uh, these two protocols will converge. Okay? Uh, some design considerations to, um, to point out. Um, the way this thing is designed, there is no third party that is required to be in the middle of the protocol flow. And that's very important. It was very important to the relying parties that drove some of the initial requirements of how FIDO was designed. Um, now, you can insert one if you wish to, but the protocol itself doesn't require it. That's very important. Um, there are no secrets on the server side. There are public keys. Okay, so if someone steals those public keys, whoop de doo the relative amount of damage that you can do is, is not great. And most importantly, what you've done is you've eliminated the ability to do scalable attacks in this system. Okay? Um, there is a strong focus on user privacy that biometric data should never, ever, ever leave the user device. Um, what I would say to you in the audience is, you know, if you're relying parties and you're considering using biometrics, um, uh, be very careful about this idea that, oh, gee, you know, I could, I could do server-side matching of some kind. Because essentially you're running up against some, some similar problems to passwords in, in that particular area. So we designed the system to say core principle, biometric data never leaves the user device. There's no linkability between those RPs because if I'm going to eBay or an, an Amazon, I have two different private keys for, yeah, for, uh, for those guys. And there's no linkability between those accounts. FIDO is agnostic to methods of authentication. We fully realize that today's authenticators may not be tomorrow's authenticators. You know, people are coming up with all kinds of cool widgets. Um, you know, there's the, there's the continuous authentication stuff with cardiac uh, rhythms. There's, uh, you know, I joke that one of these days somebody's going to invent the lick your phone sensor, uh, and, and then what are you going to do? So, so FIDO took the approach that, that says, look, we don't care. At the end of the day, people, are, people know what their risk profiles are, and they're going to choose something that is business appropriate, risk appropriate, could be software, could be hardware, could be certified hardware, could be you know, stuff that is defense rated, uh, we don't care. Um, 
One of the interesting things that you can do, uh, and we often get asked this question, gee, can you, um, you know, can you invoke one authenticator and then another authenticator? You know, can I make the user swipe their finger and insert that USB key? Sure you can. Can you do them serially? Uh, you know, do one, then do the other, sure. Can you ask them to do them? Yes, you can. Right, so the system's pretty flexible from a, from a design perspective, which allows you to do some things to say, well, if you're looking at your account balance, you know, you know, as long as, as I have some assurance that it's the same device, it's fine, I, I don't care. Oh, no, no, you want to transfer money, I need consent. I need, I need you to actually swipe a finger or do something like that. Um, so, so one of the things from an implementation perspective that, that we started to see very quickly was that people started to implement FIDO authenticators in, uh, in these three kinds of flavors, right? So one flavor is I have an authenticator, and, and, and in principle, what this, this authenticator looks like is it lives in user space. It does its uh, key storage and cryptography in software. It does the uh, user input output in software um, and all of the protocol work that it needs to do in, in software. And then we saw some that are saying, well, no, 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 well, uh, let's do the crypto layers in some kind of secured hardware. Could be a secure element, could be a TEE, could be some exotic uh, piece of, of firmware that, you've, that somebody's designed. Um, and then we'll still have the user input output in user space and, and, uh, and, the, and some of the protocol work happen there. And what we are seeing very quickly is that probably sometime late this fall, you're likely to see um, not just the key storage, not just the crypto, but also the user input output being driven by secure display. And this is pretty stunning to, to see this transition in the, in the course of a year, right? As an industry, we've been struggling with some of this stuff for about 10 years or, or more. And, and to see all of this stuff now happening in the context of consumer devices, at the high end right now, you know, cost about 700 or so, but very likely to come down in price, to have these kinds of capabilities be within shooting distance, right, is fantastic. It gives us a great opportunity as an industry to transform the security profile that we have right now uh, in, in, in our industry. And so, you know, there will be what you'd call strong methods of authentication, some stronger, some strongest, where, you know, the bulk of stuff is being done in some protected space. And we're great believers in that because malware is a persistent threat. Even with some of the better, stronger methods of authentication, you know, at the end of the day, if you can't protect against that malware, then you haven't achieved very much. When I mean, we do believe that, that with FIDO, you, you, you start to open up some of these options uh, faster and, at, in, and with more um, economy associated with it. Having said that, I think this was shown in one of the earlier talks. It's one of my favorite cartoons. It says these two nerds have stolen this, this laptop and says, blast, it's encrypted. We'll need to build a million dollar cluster to go crack that password. The other guy says, never mind, just you know, let's hit him with a five dollar wrench until he spits out the password, right? So, so I think, you know, to me, FIDO isn't about the strong guest method of authentication, right? It's about business appropriate and risk appropriate. If your adversary is a nation state, then maybe you don't want to just use that USB key or you, you don't want to use just that, that fingerprint. Maybe you want to resort to more interesting measures over there, okay? Um, so, so I think at the end of the day, keep that in mind today. Even a software-based implementation of FIDO that uses only a pin to authenticate the user arguably gives you many, many interesting benefits over and above um, what you have with username passwords, right? So the enemy is, is passwords. The enemy is scalable attacks that happen because of passwords. The friction um, that happens with users because of passwords, that's what we are trying to eliminate. Okay, um, uh, and then finally, keep this frame in mind because today uh, the financial uh, guys, uh, banking, etc., payments guys, are very used to this idea of modern authentication. They have risk-based systems in the back end. They have strong authentication at the front end. Um, and that's where life is going, okay? Uh, if you're an enterprise today and you don't have these capabilities, uh, you know, don't be alarmed. What you do need to carry away with you is that the world which we thought where a single, single strong authentication would get you the keys to the kingdom is gone. It ain't coming back, okay? This idea that somehow I have this magic smart card and it's going to carry me, it's going to give me assurances all the way into the back end is gone. So what you're always going to have is this balance between a front end and a back end, and the purpose in some sense of FIDO is to generate a better signal for this back end. This back end is looking at a dozen different signals. It's looking at uh, maybe a thousand signals, uh, you know, location, 
um, uh, transaction trajectory, history, there's all kinds of information that comes to bear. The problem is those signals are not very strong, okay? And, 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 and passwords are an extraordinarily weak signal right now and, and not reliable. And so what you end up doing is you end up generating a lot of false positives here. And that drives more friction, right? And these systems are, are hard to build and hard to maintain. And so one very important thing that FIDO is going to be able to do is to strengthen the signal that goes in from this front end on the explicit authentication side. Um, FIDO is complementary to your investments in uh, federation. You can think of FIDO as being the first mile of the problem. If you authenticate someone strongly, that federated assertion is going to be worth a whole heck of a lot more than if you authenticated the user primarily through username and password. Okay? Um, so, so here's a practical example. I'm, I'm a user um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm somehow interacting with Burger King. Uh, and, uh, and, and Burger King can say, hey, you know, Rajiv, log in using one of these methods of authentication. You get all kinds of goodies and coupons and magic things. Or Burger King could say, you know, I, I, I do burgers for a living. I'm not an identity expert. I'm going to outsource this thing to a telco or to ping or to, to some kind of an, uh, an IDP who's going to do this on my behalf, in which case FIDO is running between the user and the IDP, and what comes out of the back end is some kind of a, of a federation assertion. Um, if you want to know more about this, Paul, who's sitting right up here and introduced me, um, has a very, very eloquent uh, presentation in this regard and knows a lot of details. Uh, there are some people around this room that have actually done demonstrations of FIDO and Ping Federate and, and OpenAM and, and all of that. Come and, come and talk to us. Um, so recap, um, uh, identity is a big problem. Authentication is the problem FIDO is trying to solve, and, and particularly in the area of trying to generate a stronger signal. Um, we are trying to simplify and scale authentication. The way we've done it is through two layers of abstraction, one on the client side, one on the network. Um, and, and these key pairs are basically unique uh, to, to every RP that we are going to, which means that this problem that you had before, which is one app, one device, one method of authentication, now can be much, much, much simplified. You don't have that rat's nest, that's rat, rat's nest anymore. What you get is this, is this single online protocol, a single backend authentication infrastructure, and the ability to plug in all kinds of devices, uh, all kinds of methods of authentication, and when someone does invent that lick your phone sensor, you won't have to rip up your backend in order to accommodate that. Okay, um, so conclusions, the enemy is symmetric shared secrets. The enemy is poor user experiences and friction. FIDO is a building block. Uh, even simple software-based authenticators with a pin will give you many advantages and protect you from, from some of the problems that you have with, with passwords, and it's complementary to federation. So now, what is this alliance? How, you know, when did it, where did it come from? How, how, how long has it been around? Well, some of the technical work probably happened over a three, four year period. The FIDO Alliance was formally launched last year in February with about six founding members. And we've grown very, very, very quickly um, to about uh, 140 members, I think. Um, so what's remarkable about this alliance as well is this is not a technical industry uh, alliance loaded with vendors. Um, there are some very, very significant relying parties, uh, people that consume this technology that have a strong voice and a strong seat at the table that are saying, this is what I want out of my authentication framework, okay? And that's been influencing our, our, our uh, development. Uh, and, and you're likely to see some very interesting things emerge uh, as we go forward. Um, the purpose of the alliance, obviously, is to, is to develop, first and foremost, clear, clean paper specifications um, that many, many people, many, many people will be implementing, okay? We expect many servers, many different clients, many different authenticators, and we expect them all to be interoperating and to go through some kind of conformance testing if they want a trademark that says, you know, FIDO certified, for example. Um, uh, the Alliance also undertakes uh, uh, seminars like this to drive some thought leadership, to drive clarity about where we fit in with some of the rest of the standards out there, and to nurture an ecosystem of, of, of players to deliver some of these implementations to market and for relying parties to consume it. Um, the Alliance is not shipping products. You can't buy a product from the Alliance. The Alliance is not a vendor. Um, the, the implementations are left to commercial vendors at some point. There might be an open source implementation or two that emerges today 
it's, it's a bunch of vendors that have made early investments in this area that can help you. Um, and, and beyond the core protocol, remember, FIDO has no domain semantics. FIDO, even though some of the early uses of FIDO have been pioneered by the payments players uh, and, and some of the banking folks are using it, uh, FIDO is not about payments. FIDO is not about biometrics. FIDO is not about silicon. FIDO is not about software methods of authentication. It's really a framework. It's a building block that allows you very, very cleverly. And it has no domain semantics, so you can adapt it. If you happen to be in healthcare, wonderful. This is, you know, you want to do, do something clever uh, with, uh, with patient uh, benefits over, over the network. Well, you could use something like this to do that. And so there are some companies that are involved in FIDO on the health side, on the, on the national security side, on the banking side. All kinds of interesting people are people who are ATM makers who are trying to re reimagine what banking of the future might look like are involved as well. Um, and so what you'll see is that vendors will deliver FIDO specifications either as products or services, either standalone or as part of that big solution stack of the pyramid that I showed you, right? It's going to arrive, this protocol solution is going to arrive in many different form factors, and there may be many extended use cases that are being explored by vendors before they make their way into the protocol. We've been very deliberate to try and hold some things outside the protocol to keep it simple, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's still, it's still a, a big piece of work. Um, so we are very proud to say that, that um, in February of, of, of uh, uh, this year, uh, we had um, uh, launched our, our, our specifications for public review. These are not implementation drafts. Um, if you want implementation rights today that accrues through membership in the FIDO Alliance. Uh, the specs are not necessarily the best way to understand what FIDO is if you happen to be an enterprise or someone who wants to use FIDO. Uh, if you are someone who wants to implement it as a, as a product, um, it's, it's uh, you know, certainly a great read for, for you folks. Um, and there are some vendors in, in the room also that can give you some implementation tips and guidance here. But the, the, the specs are out there. We are driving very hard uh, towards an implementation draft, um, which we hope uh, sometime later this year to, to conclude. Um, there is a formal set of, of uh, steps and processes given the membership and, and IP procedures that we have to go through, but we are very, very hopeful that in the very near future there, there, there will be a, a, a implementation draft uh, and then at some point beyond the implementation draft, um, uh, the, the standard will, after we are reasonably comfortable that it's not changing rapidly, um, as I said, uh, go out to some, some kind of an external standards body. Um, so many, 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 many vendors um, have uh, jumped in uh, to provide solutions in different form factors. And, uh, and if you go to the FIDO website, you'll see a page called FIDO Ready. And, and you know, there are some people who've advertised there. There are many more that are investing uh, in, in FIDO-related products. Uh, we've demonstrated FIDO running on a simple, secure element. Um, we've demonstrated it with fingerprints and mobiles, with uh, speaker recognition, mobile over NFC, uh, different form factors from a USB key with a secure element to, uh, to TPMs uh, and, and other kinds of authenticators. Um, so here's something to keep in mind. I took you through the design intent of the protocol. Uh, that was the design intent. We deliberately had to hold some things outside the core protocol just to keep, keep it simple. And remember, it's a building block. Um, so I've described the design intent. At the end of the day, this is the golden specification. Uh, however, specific implementations may go well beyond what the protocol specifies because they're adapting it to a particular market, to medical devices, to, um, to uh, you know, rocket ships. I don't know. Uh, you know lo lots of interesting implementations where what FIDO looks like uh, from an implementation stack perspective could look very different. We've seen FIDO implementations all in JavaScript. We've seen FIDO implementations pretty much all in firmware, right? So that's the span. And, and so there's nothing saying that the FIDO client has to look like this or that. Um, implementations will vary. And then obviously, because it's a building block, uh, you're going to see all kinds of solutions uh, in, in that triangle stack that I described, uh, where some people are going to offer it as a service. They're going to offer it as a service that's only authentication. Some people will offer it as a, as a solution that might be served just a product. Some people will say, okay, no, I, I want to bundle it with the full IDP stack. So it's useful to keep those things separate. The FIDO Alliance is simply trying to create that specification to let a thousand flowers bloom in, in this space. So here's the good news. Again, in, in, in a, in, within a couple of years worth of work, 
There are some OEMs that are shipping FIDO-ready products today. So if you buy that Lenovo ThinkPad with a TPM or a fingerprint sensor, the odds are it has a FIDO client on it. Um, likewise, if you buy a Samsung Galaxy S5 with that fingerprint sensor, um, it's being powered by FIDO software. There are FIDO clients available for Windows 7, Windows 8, Android, iOS, etc. cetera. Um, there are all kinds of, of uh, authenticators that have been plugged in to this, variables, um, uh, you know, exotic methods from iris recognition to, you know, things that are biometrics that are not mainstream, biometrics that are mainstream, silicon-based stuff, things that you carry around on a leash, all kinds of cool stuff out there that the vendors can, can show you. We're also very proud to say that the first FIDO deployment is actually live. Um, you know, PayPal and Samsung uh, pioneered uh, a, a, um, uh, a release to market in April of this year. Um, where they're accepting fingerprint-based payments from a uh, Samsung S5, okay? <clears throat> and and uh, let me tell you, I mean, if you, uh, I'm sure many of you here have have iPhones and and uh, and um, the Touch ID. Um, many of you may have the the Samsung S5 as well. Once you start to use these easier to use methods of authentication, you know, you keep looking for them everywhere you go because you, it's addictive. It's like you'd say, well, geez, this is, this is the right way to do it. So we are very hopeful. Um, and then uh, even more good news, um, the, the uh, second public deployment is, is a company called Alibaba. Uh, you know, Alibaba is, is uh, the payments uh, part, or used to be the payments part of the, Alipay is the, is the payments part of the Alibaba group. Um, you know, that's, that's a pretty damn big number. Uh, and, and, and those guys are, are saying, you know, th this is good stuff. Uh, we want to use it. We want to take it to market. And, uh, and so, you, so expect to see more of these guys uh, rolling out. I think there's, there's probably a dozen uh, different POCs and pilots that I'm aware of personally. Um, I'm, I'm sure that there's many more. Um, so remember, this is really about, uh, you know, while we keep talking about security on, as one side of the equation, I don't want you to forget the better user experience. Because traditionally, we've been used to thinking about authentication as being about risk or regulation or reputation. Increasingly, these initiatives are being driven out of the business side of the house. Because when you look at those abandoned shopping carts or the customer friction um, that's involved in your users interacting with you, people are realizing that authentication really should be about design, delight, and dollars because it's the gateway to your user experience. You can build a wonderful widget, you can build a terrific portal, great web experience, and then you have this crappy authentication process for the user to walk through, and then they lose faith in you, right? They abandon you. And so, so really for us, FIDO should be really about design, delight, and dollars, while this you know, is something that, that should be the, the foundation and backbone. Um, so the call to action, you know, FIDO's here. Uh, it, it, is, it is not a... Um, it is not a mystery. You can, you can interact with many people. You can touch and feel it. You can play with it. You can implement it if you like. Um, you know, so, so depending on who you are, launch POC or a pilot, um, you know, it's, it's relatively straightforward. Um, if you're a product vendor, then adapt your products to FIDO. We run three plenaries a year. And, and sometimes during those plenaries, we invite people. We are very interested from a membership perspective in not just having vendors, but also having some uh, people who are relying parties people who are going to use FIDO to come and say, this is what we want, right? And they're a large part of the FIDO community today. Uh, come to the Alliance and contribute. We are a volunteer-run organization, right? At the end of the day, the marketing working group and the technical working group and the privacy working group and the certification and, and, uh, and public policy working group needs people who are industry aware, like you, okay? And so we invite you to come and participate. Uh, Donald can, can get you started on that process. If you have some, some questions, I'm happy to, to answer them, and, and that concludes my presentation. Yes. Um, so it's authentication to device to device to the network. My daughter has gone through nine cell phones in the first year. Yes. Uh, would she have to re-enroll in every one of her uh, online accounts using FIDO? Uh, great question. Uh, so, so I think everybody heard the question, which is I, what I call the portability and device reprovisioning question. I'll roll them into one, right? Um, which is any time that you, you decide that you're going to authenticate using a specific device, 
um, and for some reason you you know you drop it into the fishbowl or or, or worse, um, you know how are you going to get re-sparked on all of the different places where you had enrolled? And and the answer is that the FIDO protocol itself today has very little to say about that. Right. So if you if you go read the protocol specifications, they don't tell you a lot about the portability aspect. Um, there are vendors uh, that have adapted various solutions to ease uh, that provisioning and to make things more portable. Uh, the external form factor that we just spoke about, which is the U2F, um, uh, sometimes makes it easy to walk around from device to device. Reprovisioning is always a problem. Okay? And, and the question is, what's your security posture and what do you allow? And there isn't a single uh, method that will allow you to do, at, do it across relying parties. Uh, without some core compromise on the privacy side or having a service provider somewhere in the middle who acts as a broker for you, right? So one, one way in which you could accomplish this is you could say, gee, you know, I don't care if I deal with an entity that has perfect knowledge of all the places that I go um, interact with, uh, but I will therefore have the convenience of authenticating to that one entity through a single credential that will then broker my access to all these 15 sites. So if I ever lose that, phone, then reprovisioning only involves one entity, right? And these are all compromises from a technical architecture perspective that you can try uh, to, to implement. Again, I want to distinguish between what the protocol has to do and what solutions in the marketplace have to do. And future versions of FIDO will try and tackle some of those problems. But again, we want to be cognizant that, that reprovisioning considerations for a bank may be very different from reprovisioning re considerations for a social website. Brett. Uh, <coughs> I just want to speak the same, the same thing. I'll just put a slightly different summary on it. So right now, think of FIDO that's about to go to implementation draft as V1. V1 of U2S, V1 of UAS. We have a requirements process. We already have requirements. We triage V2. This is square requirements bucket for V2. So we're going to be addressing it as a standards effort. But in addition to that, I think there will be commercial efforts. For example, if you own an ecosystem, a platform, you want to make it really easy to move those key stores around on your devices. So I think you'll see commercial efforts solving that use case outside of the standard. But the standard sending organizations also can stack that use case. Thanks. Question in the back. Sure. 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 Got it. So to summarize the question, uh, the question is about: um, Is there something in the protocol or the or a solution um, that allows you, as the relying party, to seek user consent and to to negotiate back and forth? Between about what's an appropriate method of authentication. The short answer is yes, and, and stay tuned. And as you go through the technical presentations, I think you'll see um, what exact capabilities are available to you across these protocols. Question? Uh, does FIDO address interoperability between implementations at all? Uh, yes. I'm glad you asked that question. The question is, uh, you know, does FIDO address interoperability between implementations? That is the entire <laughs> purpose and rationale of forming the alliance uh, and, and one of the core missions and principles behind the alliance, which will there will be multiple vendors that provide servers, that provide clients, and provide different authentication methods. And somebody's got to step up to the task of saying, hey, you know what? When you buy these things, they will interoperate. And, and so the FIDO Alliance runs uh, interop and conformance uh, programs related to this. Question. So they are changing the industry paradigm from server side to client side authentication, right? Yeah. Now, say one device, maybe Android, mm -hmm. somebody find an exploit to mm -hmm. get your secret key. Mm -hmm. If a similar exploit is found in the server side, you can quickly patch your server. But how do you patch all the clients? Okay, um, so let me see if I, I've understood your question correctly. Which is, if you've got a server-side method of authentication, then 
if you have compromises related to a specific method of authentication, then it's easier to patch on the server side um, than, than figuring out how to patch those clients. And um, let's see, what, what's a good way to answer that question? I think no, number one, um, the diversity issue is, is to me an important one because as you know, we live in a fairly heterogeneous world. And so it's fairly unlikely that for any of us we have device concentrations now uh, when we deal with customers or even our employee bases that are singularly from one manufacturer, one model, one, one uh, area. And, and so there is this interesting question of, gee, is there a universal crack somehow uh, in, a, in, a, in an implementation that, uh, that can be found um, that compromises a whole range of implementations uh, across you know, all Android devices. I'd say it's very unlikely, theoretically possible, but, but you know, I'd say what the, what's the situation you're dealing with right now? And, and look at the havoc that, that you deal with right now when, when you, you, know, you say, oh, I'm going to have to put something on my front page that says, user, please change your password. No, we didn't lose your password. Let me explain. It was because you know, this thing happened over here. Uh, you know, to me, um, Fido gives you the flexibility of provisioning the user with multiple methods of authentication and to switch from one to the other. And just because one modality has been compromised has, has no implication whether the other one's compromised or not. If there are flaws in the protocol, you know, SSL certainly has evolved along the way. Yes, you know, there's some, some step up required in that area. But this is a journey. And at the end of the day, this is a building block. And, and we are not trying to claim that we are solving world hunger here. But we do know that this is going to make what we have right now a whole heck of a lot better. So not, not a satisfactory answer, perhaps, but hopefully that sheds some light on my thinking. No, I think pretty satisfactory. I was looking more on the storage where you store the secret keys. Ah, well, well let, me, let me actually let me take a moment to address that question, right? Because to me, what makes me excited about FIDO is I mentioned earlier that if you look at the number of mobile phones that are entering the market, I think that you know, um, Samsung, I think at, at some point it shipped about a 130 million S4s. I don't know what the volume is on the S5s. Apple is shipping millions of devices. These devices are shipping with a core capability on them if they run ARM Cortex that's called Trust Zone. How many people know what Trust Zone is? Okay. So, so this, it's a very interesting capability from a security perspective that tries to create isolation for code. You know about secure elements that allow you long-term storage of, of cryptographic keys in, in a tamper-resistant area. These technologies are now available in consumer-grade devices. Okay? And consumer-grade devices today that cost you know, $600, $700 retail going very quickly to about a $300 price point. And so what you'll get in a couple of years at most is pretty much every phone will have smart card-like characteristics from an isolation perspective in consumer-grade phones. And if we can unlock that, and FIDO can be a layer to do that for you, then I think we've got some you know, very optimistic view about the, the level of protection we can achieve on the client side with respect to those keys. Okay? And that, that would be my answer. Okay. All right. Thank you.